Hi, right. good afternoon. Um, today's speaker is um, Ignacio Ugarte-Ura, who is an astrophysicist at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. Um, he got his BSc and MSc at the University of La Laguna in Tenerife, and then his PhD from Queen's University, Belfast, while working at um, the Arma uh, Observatory. Um, so he's worked on a number of so solar physics problems including CME initiation, solar wind and flares, but his main focus of study is the coronal heating problem from the point of view of understanding um, the building blocks of the solar atmosphere, coronal loops, and that's what he'll talk about today. Cool. All right, thank you Paul. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So let me, all right, this is locked. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this seminar. It's, it's great to be here. I've been in Boulder before for meetings, uh, but it's been a few years already, I think, so it's good to be at HAO and see people that I know and I'm familiar with. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are working in solar physics. I know some of you do, so I'll start with some of the basic concepts and then <laughs> If it gets, just bear with the first few minutes if, if, it's, if it's too easy and obvious. All right, so I'm going to talk today uh, about the magnetic and plasma properties of coronal loops. Is, I'm going to discuss uh, coronal heating. All right. Uh, of course, this is, I mean, I've, I'm going to talk about uh, some background work as well and some of the work that I've done. And these are the usual suspects for me in collaborations. Harry Warren, who is the head of our section group in at the Naval Research Lab. David Brooks, uh, George Mason University, and then recent collaboration with Russ Dahlberg and Giorgio Eunari and Jeffrey Rip as well at NRL. All right, so the coronal heating problem. We just want to understand, of course, why the, the solar atmosphere is, is, is hot, right? That's, that's obvious. Uh, and beyond that, if we go to some specifics, we want to understand, for example, if this is solar minimum and this is solar maximum, why are those changes in the atmosphere where we get more intense emission at particular locations, like active regions? Uh, not only that become more, more intense, but uh, in this case we have a three color uh, image with plasma at half a million, one and a half, two, and two million degree plasma. And you see that it's hotter when you are in, the, in, so, in solar max. So, the, so uh, it emits more and it's, it's, it's hotter in certain regions. Of course, we also know, uh, particularly here, I tell you, you know about magnetic fields. So the, the, the magnetic field drives uh, all those changes. So, so this is the change that you can see uh, from solar minimum to solar maximums. Um, so the obvious, the obvious thing that you all know, but I mean, a casual listener might not know. The coronal heating problem is not just about finding a mechanism that can produce one million degree plasma. Uh, at this point, I mean, we we started this problem many years ago. At, at this point, we are far beyond that, and we are is about reproducing very precise observables. And hopefully, from this talk, you will get uh, a, an impression of what are the problems, what are the the, the things, the, the areas where we have made some progress, and and what are the challenges. And. And today, the discussion about coronal heating is going to be concentrated uh, specifically on coronal loops because that's what I, I like to work on and because these are considered the building blocks of the atmosphere. And, and bearing in mind, of course, that uh, when we see a loop like this and with an instrument, as we get instruments, things change. So with the definitions of, of our current uh, take uh, with observation. So we are, you're going to hear me talk about loops, but also strands, which are fine, finer uh, filament structures that could be underneath those. Uh, so sorry if that, uh, you can ask me if, if I mix concepts, but uh, all right. So let's start with a few movies. Um, here I'm showing, this is AI and HMI, where uh, you have the magnetic field in blue and yellow, and then you have the AIA 171 on top of that. 
Uh, so what you are seeing is the evolution of the magnetic field and the, and the evolution of the uh, one million degree plasma uh, in the corona. Uh, we know that magnetism is driving the atmosphere. Um, the, magnetic, the, mag the magnetic fields, the magnetic pressure dominates in the, in the atmosphere over the plasma pressure. And that's why uh, our loops are highlighting the connectivity in the, in the corona. Um, they are highlighting the magnetic fields. Um, what we see here, for example, in this movie that evolves very rapidly, is that over long term, uh, is 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 obvious that the the changes in the ma in the magnetic field drive the changes in, in the in the loops, right? And at the root of the of the problem of the coronal heating would be at short time scales. What are those changes in the magnetic field that keep produce those changes in the in the atmosphere? We we know the energy at the, is at the photosphere. How does it get transported up into the atmosphere? That's the that's the main question. All right, so what are a few simple uh, outstanding questions uh, about the corona heating problem? Um, of course, the nature of the, of the heating. What is the physical mechanism that produces it? That's basically what we want to answer. And because we don't have a definite answer for that, um, we have some ideas. I'm going to also discuss certain properties of that. Uh, uh, of the mechanism from what we understand from the data. Uh, so as I said, hopefully we get an understanding of, of why are we struggling uh, with, uh, on this problem. All right, so I'll start with the nature of the, of the problem, and I'm going to give you just one slide, just because we don't have the, the answer to the problem. But I guess the dominant ideas, that we, that the leading ideas that we have right now, and they have been for years, is uh, are two uh, about what physical mechanism could be producing the heating. One is what we call braiding. So it's the Parker idea where you have convection at the photosphere that is shuffling and moving your magnetic field. The magnetic field gets tangled in a cartoon way. This is how you show that in 3D MHD. Uh, these are simulations for Russ Dahlberg at all. Uh, that's what you get. You, you, you tangle your field, uh, you stress that field, generate currents, and you can produce heating. And we've, we've done forward modeling of that, and you can produce million degree temperatures with that mechanism. We can achieve that now with, with uh, simulations like those. In the same way with waves, uh, we have here the granulation that is continuously buffeting, as I said, those, those flux tubes, and then that generates waves. This is a 3D MHD simulation from Van Vallehoyen. And they call this the Alvin wave turbulence. So basically, the the waves propagate up, and there, and there is this. They generate this turbulence that is um, is dissipated in the in the corona. Generally, <clears throat> um, what they have is they, they have counter propagating um, waves uh, that are uh, produce nonlinear interactions that eventually dissipate, generate currents, and, and dissipate. And this is another way of dealing with. Uh, uh, with dissipation through waves, this is abs uh, resonant absorption where your trans transverse waves uh, they generate um, an instability he here. I can have instability at this uh, transition where there is a gradient in density, and then you generate currents and that can produce heating. Uh, and these uh, these papers are also claiming that you can produce a million degree uh, plasma. Okay, so that's what I was saying. That achieving million degree plasma is is can be done with some of these models. It's about the details now. Who can, what model can explain the, the the particular details that we see in the observations? All right, so let's talk about the temporal scales in the heating. What are the characteristics time scales uh, of loops or or coronal heating? And this gives me again an opportunity to show you more movies. Later we'll get more <laughs> line plots, but all right. So this is a similar movie to the one you 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 saw earlier, and here you have all sorts of regions where you have emergence, and you can see the evolution of the on the corona and the field that is very different. You have very dynamic cases like those on top where you have emergence and very rapid formation of the atmosphere and loops, and then you can see regions like those where hardly anything changes. These are decaying active regions. There is almost no loops. I mean, there are long loops, but and, I mean, it's different to that one. You also have these fan, what we call fan loops, uh, overarching loops in the outskirts of the of the region. 
Um, if we go back to the Yoko era, and although this is an XRT movie from Hinode, um, the perception that was that we got from looking at, at the X-ray images was that it was everything was very steady. You would put a light curve, an average light curve for the whole active region or even in certain locations, and you wouldn't see variations, very significant variations. Things looked very steady, so that's why led uh, us at the beginning to consider that uh, static equilibrium would explain loops, and it was doing a good job. Uh, for, for at least for our understanding at the time. It is true as well that even in the Joko era, we, uh, there are some papers, for example, from C. Misusan on the micro flaring of, of, of loops. And this would be more like a different active region where you have more than I'm just, you see, you have the average evolution and then the individual pixels. So, I mean, if you hear X-ray loops are steady, that is true in certain cases, but, but I mean, you, you, you can see the dynamics of loops as well in the core of active regions. <coughs> then when you go to the EUV, and this will be a movie later, um, what we notice with, from trace observations, and sorry I don't have a plot there, but it, is that they were very bright up at very high altitudes. And what we discovered is that the densities were really high in the corona so that the densities could not be explained with an ecstatic equilibrium. They were what we call over-dense with respect to equilibrium. You couldn't get an equilibrium with those intensities high up in the corona. Uh, and, and the idea that, that the heating was uh, impulsive uh, got introduced at, at this time. And I, I'll describe that later on with some hydrodynamics, but this is just to show you the evolution. You, you, you can see this is uh, observations from ICE, he noted the spectrometer where, well, actually this is XRT and then this is ICE. This is from 4 million down to 400,000 degrees. And you'll see the structures here. I mean, you see them everywhere, but I'll point you at this one because it's easy to see. Uh, so you'll see that structure that eventually is going to cool down all the way here. So you see loops that are being heated to multi-million degree temperatures and then you see them cooling through the filter sensitive at different temperatures down to four, 400,000 degrees. Okay, so you see the, the dynamics. All right, some, uh, a few line plots. Uh, this is a simulation, and this is done with EPTEL, a 0D model, but it would be very similar with a 1D model. We would just solve the hydrodynamics equations on the loop. Um, in this case, we have this heating event here. This is the energy, this is the temperature, the density, and this is some intensity for particular lines, but let's concentrate here. If we, if we heat that a loop, we dump energy on the cor in the corona of the loop, and I'll, I'll go into that later. What we are going to see at the beginning is that the temperature is going to rise very rapidly. Ther thermal conduction is going to uh, transfer that energy from your corona down to the foot points, the chromosphere, and then that chromosphere that's being heated is going to send, uh, is going to evaporate material up so that the density is going to eventually go up in your loop and you'll get high densities and then your intensity in the corona is dependent on the density square. So as, as soon as you get dense, high densities, you are going to start to radiate and cool the loop through radiation. And then is when you're going to start your, you see your, your lines. This is a, an iron 18 line form at 5 million degrees. So you see here the, where was the temperature and eventually you see, you'll see that density go down and you'll see the <coughs> appearing in cooler lines. This is at 1 million degree. And if your heating is um, infrequent and enough, the heating event here is, is much later, you'll see the whole cooling of the structure. Uh, a different scenario would be if you have all sort of heating events in your in your loop, where you don't allow your uh, your loop to do the whole cycle, where you basically you are heating constantly because you will keep your your loop at a four million degree temperature. So this becomes an effectively steady heating. So looking at the movies that we saw before, the suffix rays that were not changing much that could be effectively steady heating, where you are just uh, continuously energizing your loops and some of the UV loops that you saw evolving through various filters, that is what you would see when the, your heating is more impulsive, more infrequent, and you, and you let those loops evolve. All right.
this is one way of looking at, at the temporal scales by looking at the, at the time scales. But there are other ways to look at, uh, uh, to infer something about the, 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 the time characteristics of, of that heating. And one of them could be by looking at the temperature distribution within the loop, even if you look at a, one particular instant in time. Uh, this is a study by Warren et al. where they were looking at one particular look segment here, and they would look with many uh, intensity in, in this, with a spectrometer. And what they would do is to do analysis to see where those lines, I mean, what it, w <coughs> we call this a di differential emission measure analysis, and I don't want to go into the details, but basically it's going to give you the distribution, this is temperature, it's going to give you the, the contribution of the plasma along your line of sight in your different temperature beams based on Temper on lines that are emitting at different temperatures. Uh, and they found that the distributions of the emission within your line of sight volume was pretty narrow. In this case, 6.2 in the log, that's about 1.3, 1.4 uh, million degree plasma, and not too broad. So you wouldn't find plasma at 10, uh, 10 million, you wouldn't find plasma at 1 million. It's, it's, it's sort of narrow. Uh, they would find a volume filling of only a 10%, saying that the whole volume is not filled with plasma. And that would suggest that, first of all, that there are sub-resolution strands within your volume, but all those strands should be in a very narrow temperature range. Uh, and if strands within one loop? If we call the, the loop as what you've seen this, in this, so what we see here, that would be your loop. And that's what we can resolve with our instrument. We cannot res resolve anything underneath. But if you have a volume filling of 10%, you would assume that not all that volume is filled, and there would be strands underneath that, that would fractionate in that, into that volume. Uh, did, does that answer your question? So, you, so, you, so yes, they, those, those strands would make up your apparent loop that you're seeing. So that if there are multiple strands within your volume and all at the same temperature, that would see, and if they are evolving, as we know they evolve in the UV, that would mean that there is some coherence because they all have the same temperature. They are, they're not one hot and others are cool. They are sort of all in the same range. So whenever they got heated, they got heated and then they evolved together. That's what you would uh, interpret for that. And that led, I mean, this is probably not very important for, for our community, the nanoflare storms is one of the concepts that came up of some of these studies, is that um, originally the Parker's, the Parker scenario, you would have this braiding that would happen continuously. It should be sort of random, and you would expect to have all, all temperatures all the time everywhere, because you would energize all the strands all the time. Uh, and that would clash with this, because you should expect to see 1 million and 5 million degree plasma at the same time. In a, in a scenario like this, you would have your temperatures would, nar would be na uh, in a narrower temperature range. So the, 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 start, the modelers started to talk about nanoflare storms, where you would have a moment where you would produce that storm on nanoflares. And I don't know if I want to go to this, but the, the flow chart diagrams that we discussed at the time, and I don't want to go into the details, but is the loop over dense? Yes, as I was saying, okay, this must be impulsive heating. Okay, and then is it multi-stranded? Okay, how multi-thermal it is? If it is little, that must be a short storm. If it is a, so that's how the the discussion was framed uh, at that point. And and some of the late work in, that has been done on on this in in the literature, and there has been a lot of effort. You see, there are a few papers. Uh, we, we can, I mean, doesn't necessarily start with this paper, but this uh, phrase it very well. It is that, you, that your distribution of temperatures within your volume will change depending on the, of, of the properties of the time scale of your heating. Because um, I forgot to say you something, so I'll, I'll say earlier on when I was showing you the simulation. I'll say it now. When you, actually, I'll go back one second just to show you something. When you have an, an event like this one, which is similar to that one, if, if you have a, an evacuated loop, it very quickly goes very high up in temperature because you, you, it very efficiently you send your temperature for thermal conduction. While in a case where you already have a very dense plasma there, you don't raise that temperature that much. So uh, in, those, um, in those cases, what they were seeing is when the, you had a, 
a low frequency heating, you would have an excess of high temperatures in your, in your distribution of temperatures that you would observe, and not as much uh, when you would have uh, something steadier. And you would see a, a larger component of cool temperatures because you're processing through all the temperatures if you allow them to cool. While if you have a steadier situation, you keep an, a, a, a very limited uh, temperature range. So anyway, the sit where is the situation right now? Uh, from all these papers and others looking at this from the observational point of view and also modeling 1D, 0D, and uh, we don't do as much of 3D in this type of study. We do, I mean, the community does 3D, but I'll, I'll discuss later what, what we do in those terms. Um, there's a broad spectrum of heating frequencies that we think we see in the corona in different uh, um, situations, let's call it like that. Um, there, there is actually a potential evolution of those frequencies over, over an active region H. As I saw you, the, the properties of the active regions at, when they are emerging or where they are decaying are slightly different. And, but it, uh, at least many of these papers uh, agree that an intermediate frequency where the heating of the timescales of the heating are comparable to the timescales of the cooling seem to do better than, than other cases. In, so this is a bit broad, but, but uh, there's been some progress. We, we, we think we understand a little bit better the time sets of the heating in, in loops. And of course, there's plenty of, progress, <laughs> plenty of work to be done here before we can uh, say this, this has been sorted. OK. Um, let's, let's move on to something else, spatial scales. So what are the fundamental heating spatial scales? Models would predict that, and often, when, you, when I talk about models, I'm going to talk about the braiding model, because this has been the most developed one, the one that where you have the shuffling of the field and the reconnection in the current sheets. They predict that this reconnection at the current sheets that form in your loop, and here what we have is, this is a cross-section in a simulation where we have a, this is simulating your convection cells, basically uh, perturbing your field. And these are the currents that get generated. And I, you might not see that well from back, but there are very thin currents here. So um, they expect these currents to be very thin, which is where the heating is deposited, down to kilometers, which are basically the resolution, resolution elements of these simulations. So it can go down to meters. So that's the kind of scales that, from the uh, theory and the 3D MSD modeling uh, point of view, is that we should expect the heating. What happens when we go to the data? What can we say from the data and where our limited resolution? Because in the corona, uh, I mean, we are talking about 0.6 arc seconds, 0.3 iris, right? Point, is it 0 0.3, 0 0.1. Um, we're talking about several hundred kilometers often. When we see a loop like this, and we look at that cross section, what are we seeing? I mean, uh, how can we interpret it that data? Are we seeing at some volume? I mean, what you were asking, is it completely filled? Is it only partially filled with one strand but we cannot resolve? Is it multiple strands under your volume that produce an envelope that is similar to that one? What is the density and temperature distribution within your loop? And that, can that tell you something about the scales of, of, of that heating, where that heating is being deposited? And I'm sure you're now asking, I mean, thinking about, that depends on how you see. I mean, this plot is really nice. This is from a paper from Marcus S. Vanden and Hardy Peter. And this was from last year, late last year, where they plotted basic, all these are different studies, a different wavelengths with different instrumentation. And you can see here, AIA, SDO, Trace, Iris, High C. All these black lines give you the, resolu the, yeah, the resolution of, the, of your instrument. This is width in megameters. Uh, this this is just to an index to to go through your uh, the number of, of studies. I bet if there was a time here, time would would go that way, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I don't know which ones are these ones, but basically, when we had bad resolution and our the measurements that we had for loops, the resolve widths were bad. And as we got better instrumentation, we, th we were resolving better and better. So we are saying, <laughs> I mean, that's when are we stopping? When are we reaching our limit? We probably, all the time we were thinking we were reaching our, our limit, right? Um, so this was a good moment to show you this. When we see a loop, I mean, 
what happens when we see it with a better instrument? What are we seeing underneath? All right, so many of these studies, what they would do is try to see what are the scales that we are resolving, are they meaningful? And you would look at the cross-section, look at your intensities, look at the cross-section, and say, my loops are resolved. OK, is it bigger? Is it, uh, this, those are the scales of my loops. It's, it, the problem goes when you are reaching the limit of your resolution element, right? If you're, let's assume your resolution is, is this uh, orange area, and, and your uh, strand or loop is, is below that. So, so you, what you would observe is the PSF of the instrument, which is the minimum uh, extension that you can see from a point source in, in your instrument. Uh, so that's useful, but it, it has some constraints. It's more useful if, if we then use a spectroscopy and we look, for example, at what is the intensity here and what is the density there. We, have some, we can get some estimates of densities and, and, uh, from the ratio of two intensity lines that are dependent on the, in the population of the lab for, through the density. Because your intensity in a spectral line depends on the atomic physics. I say this Chianti just to make it more obvious. The square density and then your volume. And this is just divided by your pixel element. Um, so if you know your density from your observations, you know your intensity from your observations, uh, you have to resolve from there your, your radius that depends on, for example, the number of strands. I mean, uh, you can know if you, if you can have a, a, a field volume or not to explain the data you have. I'll put an example and it's going to be show up better. This was, uh, this was from a paper that, that we did back in 2012. We, we got this, this loop section. Uh, this is look at many different lines at different temperatures. As you see, in some of the lines you see the, the structure. In some of the other lines you don't see it. So it has a particular range of temperatures where you see that loop. You can get a density and the distribution of temperatures there. And the question is, in this particular case, if you take your density and you take um, your model uh, radius for your structure, are you able to reproduce the observed cross-section that you see in ICE and AIA? And in this particular case, with one single strand, that density and that cross-section, you could reproduce both. So the conclusion would be, from the density that I'm getting in that volume, that volume is filled to explain my intensities. And that is not always the case. Because there are cases where you can go and you, you need uh, you don't have sufficient um, sufficient volume. Sorry, if you feel that with with one single strand, because your volume would be much larger than the final solution, you would have a much much larger intensity than that you observe. So you de so so that's that's when you go into your filamentation and your f volume filling. Uh, some of these observations cannot be explained with, uh, with your plasma being completely filled. And, and that's when we said we would need multiple strands to, to, to explain that. And uh, there was something underneath, I, I see that it went direct to the conclusions, but basically this paper, the conclusions were the typical side, uh, the majority of loops are not are unresolved, but there are loops that can be resolved with current instrumentation. That's what we said at the time. And typical sizes of the hundreds of kilometers and the heating should be able, any heating should be able to explain those scales. I mean, how do you get to distribute your density over hundreds of kilometers? That's important for the heating. Um, all right. Even if, maybe I shouldn't go there, but even if those other strands were the same density and temperature, let's put it, how do you get to distribute your heating through hundreds of kilometers? So anyway, there was, uh, I thought it was interesting to discuss this because there was a very recent paper, the, the one that I was talking earlier about, Marcos Svander and, and Hardy Peter, probably got uh, picked up by more people using high C observations, though all these are high C, where they were saying that images are, images are fully resolved in high C. So where the typical value of the structure is around 500 kilometers, and this supports heating operating at microscopic scales. Those are conclusions from, from now. <laughs> Uh, from the from from the latest papers on the highest resolution in the corona, and 
some of you are thinking about the plot I showed yesterday about getting better instrumentation, but I'm giving you a, a reason why using a spectroscopy density that would make sense for from other point of view. But not everybody agrees on this. I mean, I guess, well, I guess David, led a, David Brooks led another study with high C data that got the same conclusions as the 2012 that is consistent with this one. But there was a, uh, a paper from Hardy, Peter, and collaborators where while they were not seeing, <laughs> this is an interesting conclusion, they were not seeing superstructures in some of the high C data, the high resolution, their conclusion was either, yes, the density of the temperature varies very smoothly, as these guys are proposing, or actually the loopsons are really fine. They, must, they have to be like 15 kilometers f uh, wide, uh, and you, you, should, you would be able to reproduce uh, those, those, those cross sections, just because the overlap of all the emission of all those fine structures occupying a certain part of the volume through the PSF would, 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 uh, so is, <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is spatial scales, the, the debate is still open. We are waiting for uh, the results of high C. I know you, you, you got last week discussion here. I was trying to follow through the webcast. Um, we are hoping, those who do spectroscopy, we are ha hoping to get some subar second spectroscopy in the future to, to try to resolve this uh, in the corona, because Aris is doing it, but uh, the corona loops. All right, we've, we've gone through temper time scales, uh, spatial scales. So where is the heat in the deposited. I don't know, maybe I should have asked a question and say, what do you think it is? Or what do you think the community thinks it is? And, you know, I had it divert, the, the, uh, inversed with mostly in the corona, but eventually I, I reversed it back because I, so what I was noticing is that, uh, and these are, these are bifrost simulations, you, I'm sure you're familiar with them. This is good extent, some of the earlier work, and this is Hansen. I'll go now into the details of that. There is some modeling here from Fabio Reale in Italy, in Catania, uh, Palermo, sorry. Um, when, what they find is that the reconnection, when, and this is again, this is the braiding model, at the very least this one. This is just modeling convection and seeing what happens in the, in the corona. Um, what they find is that there is rec the, the currents are formed everywhere along your loop, everywhere in your atmosphere, but this is, this is the current, uh, and this is the height, and you see that the current is concentrated at the foot points. That's what I said, even per unit, uh, per unit mass, I think. Uh, so these papers are saying that the, most of the heating is at the upper chromosphere, lower corona. And and I believe the wave paper from Van Vallehoen says something along those lines, but I, I may be wrong with that. Interestingly enough, e enough uh, mostly in the corona, there are, I mean, it's the usual suspects, Gene Klinchuk and collaborators, uh, who are claiming in their papers that chromospheric, if chromospheric heating was at play in the lower corona, the signatures that we would observe would be different. We would have stronger flows, would have larger intensities in the chromosphere, and they say we are not observing that. So I guess there is, there is still a discussion of what's going on in, uh, where is the heating being deposited? And I guess mark your bets there and, and see, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of room to make into that. I'm going to give you here my contribution to this, or what we have done recently into that direction is, is from a different perspective, just to give you a different way of looking at this problem. Um, and this is the figure that you saw earlier on. Um, there's one interesting thing about these observations is that this ice, the spectrometer, or from here to here, that goes down to 400,000. The next thing here is iris, and iris goes up to, to, to how high? It goes to a few hundred, 100,000, 80,000? That's right, but, but second, so yeah. But most of them, I mean, the upper, I guess, yeah, silicon, four. silicon four, which is the one I have in the next slide, which is eighty thousand yeah. degrees. So there is a big gap to know what happens to those loops when they cool. What happens? 
And we were looking at that, to if that could give you some uh, interested insight into, into, okay, the movie's playing, but we don't want to see the movie again. All right, I don't know how well you can see that. This is in blue. Here you have a silicon four line that Paul was referring to, the 80,000 degrees. And this is the silicon seven, 600,000 degrees. So you, you see the big gap in temperatures that there are between those two lines. If you look at these movies enough, and I know this, the contrast is not great for the yellow, but this we are using the slots, which is sort of like a spectral heliogram where we, well, I shouldn't go into, into the details, but it's not getting the line, it's just a broad, uh, a broad slit, so it complicates sometimes the interpretation. But uh, these are images of the, of the silicon seven line in, at, the, at this temperature. And we see when we see loops cooling down to those temperatures, remember those are the ones that were in the far right in the previous movie. If we see those loops in the next pass band in the blue, they, always, they are forming rain. Any loop that you see in silicon four is rain. I don't see any loops that are different, like a closed loop that you, as you would expect. This is another movie. This is in only using AIA, where you have in Iron Eight. This is uh, I had I guess 450,000 degrees, 131, and then helium 2304 at 20,000 degrees. And it might be hard to see from the distance, but basically the conclusions are the same. This is uh, an integrated getting the maximum intensity in a certain wi time window. So where are your loops in any given moment? And you see that the, the loops that we see here are, tend to be the ones that we see here. And when we look at Leukers in certain locations, um, what we see is that the loops that we see here in the cool lines are coming from the hot lines. But when we see those, those loops cooling, they are forming rain. So I guess I'm getting at two things here. Um, and I, maybe this flowchart makes it easy to understand or maybe complicates things better. But let's assume we have a two to five million degree loop in our active region. There are two situations that simplifying could happen. There's no cooling. And we show earlier movies where X-ray loops were not changing much. Or it could, or, or the loop could go through a sequence of filters where you see that clearly cooling through the band passes. Through hydrodynamics, and there's a lot of literature on this. <laughs> to produce loops that are not cooling, that is to have an effectively steady heating in your loop, you have to have high frequency heating in the corona. That's what I showed you earlier in the plot. If you have a frequent enough, your loop doesn't cool because you are heating it and you're keeping it at a high temperature. If you heat it at the foot points and you do the simulations, it changes slightly the problem. And uh, for now, just take, take that for true that you need intermediate frequency to get that. The, the, your time scales have to be of the order of your cooling time to, to be able to sustain that in your in, 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 at a high temperature. What happens when the loops are cooling? And this is part of the work that we've done. When they go past this 400,000 degree plasma, it could either produce coronal rain, which is what I was showing you, or it produce something else. Something else. I don't know what, but something else. I see rain. I don't see something else just yet. But when you do the simulations, what you should expect is uh, if you have a monolithic loop, let's say, for idealized, that is, you see the meeting everywhere the same you would see that through all the temperatures as it cools down. You would see them cooling through monolithically. When you have coronal rain, you have condensations that form in certain locations. And, and the hydrodynamics are different for those two. If you put high frequency heating at your food points, in principle, we would say, oh, you put high frequent heating and you keep it that hot. But it's a very particular regime because your heating is very concentrated at the food points. So what happens is you evaporate all this plasma up into your loop. It gets very dense. It starts to radiate a lot like crazy, but there's no heating up there to balance that, that those losses. So there is a catastrophic cooling that happens there. There is a runaway process that eventually forms a condensation that normally through asymmetries goes and comes down. And then the loops, oh, I want that equilibrium, and it's continuing heating, so it forms that again. And so there are cycles. 
So it's not steady. There are cycles that produce this emission that you are seeing, this falling, this rain that you are seeing. To produce something else, and the standard heating that would be any sort of intermediate of low frequency heating in the corona, the classical nanoflare picture, that doesn't produce rain. Papers right now, don't, the literature does not produce rain. And that is something to highlight. And, and this is just another case of low frequency heating at the foot points would produce exactly the same thing as putting in the corona. And this is what I mentioned earlier. I guess I can skip that. But the important thing to come out of this here is that foot point heating can explain both branches. And coronal heating cannot explain this coronal range. So either foot point heating is needed, or we have to improve our coronal heating models. <laughs> I mean, Ocon Razor maybe would go right now, oh, that must be foot point heating. But uh, I'll bring one, thing, one topic. Flares have rain, and flare is impulsive, and we know recognition happens up there. So I believe there is a lot of room here to, in the heating, in the corona. So I think there needs to be some progress here on to understanding of how heating in the corona can produce rain, uh, condensations. All right. I have five minutes left, so I, I'm going to go fast through through this. This is actually the, the work that I've been doing lately, but I didn't want to give you 45 minutes of, the, of this. I thought it would be more interesting to give you various, various topics. Um, so we know the magnetic field is playing a role to heat the corona, uh, to, to dry the system. So how does the energy scale with that magnetic field? I guess that was the question that I was trying to answer. Um, magnetic field strength and loop geometry are two ingredients in the heating of atmosphere that has been recognized many years ago. There is this paper that you might be familiar with, Mandrini from 2000, where she took all the possible heating scenarios and they look at the heating scaling, how does it depend with B, how does it depend with L and other quantities. And then they try, they, 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 they made a, actually this is for a different paper, but basically all following papers, they look at parameter space and then see if we could discriminate uh, what was the, from our observations, what was happening in the corona. Um, the problem is that we didn't have a good way of uh, estimating those magnetic and properties. We had some models, but they are not, they have been improving over the years. So that's where I guess we jump in. There was another paper working on that. So what we did recently is to look at, uh, in this case, three active regions with increasing magnetic total unsigned flux, the total unsigned flux in the, in the um, we, then, we, we have, well, we use Marcus's van der identification software to find loops in those regions, and then uh, we basically select those, region, those, those loops that are uh, good for our sample. And I don't go, I mean, you can ask me later questions why, but those are the loops that are going to, we are going to use in the study. And then what we want to know about those loops that we selected in our active region is what are the magnetic properties, and we did that through magnetic modeling. And, and I encourage you to go and look at this paper from Harry Warren, where they basically look at three different methods of extrapolation, potential, and two nonlinear, Wiegelmann's uh, code, and one that Marcus van den has developed recently. And they tried to see which one was better at, at, at getting uh, the topology of these loops through various metrics. And the, in general, the nonlinear force-free models the outperformed potential extrapolations. So I think we are, we are in a good uh, situation to, to basically look at those extrapolations and compare them to the plasma properties of those loops. Uh, so this is just a tool we use, but basically we have these three methods. We can calculate the, we do the extrapolation of the field, right? We take the surface, we extrapolate our field, and then we compare that to the, to how those loops are outlined in the coronal images. In this case, we look at uh, iron 18, this is 5 million degree plasma. Uh, and then from through that, we can get the, the strength of the field anywhere in the loop, foot points in the corona, the, the, the geometry, the loop length. And then this is kind of a novel uh, 
for, for this, uh, this type of analysis, what we go is we go back to our images. This is the trace loop in our topology. We select a region that is clean for us to look at the plasma dynamics, and then we look at the light curve. So we, sorry, we straighten up that loop. We get a cross section that is sort of a profile. We measure that cross section. We get the intensity. We see, and then we go at the peak of the intensity. Whenever that loop peaks, because there's no guarantee that when we are doing our extrapolation, we are at any particular relevant moment of the evolution of that loop. Um, it could be that we pick a loop that has just picked, or it could be that we just find the latest stages of evolution of that loop. So we want to compare apples to apples and, and pairs to pairs, I guess. So we go to the peak intensity of those loops, and then we get the intensity. Actually, we divide it by the volume, because it could be that you're, it occupies a very big volume. So we, we, we get at the intensity per unit volume. All right, so this is the result. What we find is that the, the intensities of those loops are correlated to the field strength, the average field strength of a loop and the loop length anti-correlated. And the B over L, which was uh, one of the scalings that some of the modeling papers have used in the past, uh, we see that correlation. And in this case, we see it directly from observation. There is no, well, there is magnetic modeling here but there's no corona heating model just yet here. This is just the scaling comes directly from the observations, which is nice, uh, that we can basically get the, uh, a, a scaling on those loops based on the, on, on the observations. We did some modeling, but maybe I should skip to the conclusions about what does it, so the, the, the only thing that to highlight here is this is the scaling for an intensity, but it doesn't tell us what is the intensity, the, the scaling of the heating, which is what we really want to know. We want to know how that energy that goes into the loop. So we, we did some simulations with EPTEL, uh, and because we are um, in 45 minutes, I think I'm, I'm going to skip that. But basically, we end up finding a scaling through uh, using that uh, <clears throat> the magnetic field. So I, I have to say one thing. We, we introduce an energy into our EPTEL simulations that scales with B and L based on the topology that we have in our loops. And then we see what happens with the intensities. And we do that for all the loops. And we have some metrics about uh, what parameter space does better. And we ended up finding that the scaling with the magnetic field scale of 0.3 down to the, the loop length is the one that works better. Uh, and that, in parameter space, compares well with other studies that have been in the past that were reached through a slightly different method where there was more modeling involved. So I guess the conclusion to this is that even, is here the conclusion, both from full active region modeling, previous studies, and individual loop modeling, we have a parameter space with the dependence of B over L. That on its own doesn't tell us uh, the answer about coronal heating. But it gives us a, a lot of information for the future work. Because so how do we make it progress with all the information that we have? And this is more about future uh, work uh, that we are involved in. So we have an active region. We have great observations. We take uh, images every 12 seconds, multiple lines. We have a spectrum. What can we do? For example, from, from the imaging point of view, we can just and this is some, some work that I did a, a few years ago, uh, we can simply find events that are happening. This is just detection of events, and these are the phases of those events. We can get some statistics of what's going on in those. And then we can go and, and do an, uh, a simulation and do an extrapolation of your field. You have your magnetic field, as I was saying earlier. You can put a plasma model. I forget about the details there, but EPTEL. Just you do your hydrodynamics in each one of your loops. And then you can produce a simulation. This is a simulation of an active region uh, with the same magnetic uh, configuration. And then see how they match. You can do some statistics comparisons. So I guess I should have said, how do we make progress from here? Some people are going to use first principle models, where they're going to run their simulations in 3D, 3D MSD, have your convection, have your simulation, get generate your corona, see if you produce the observables. Those simulations are great, are, the, are the, the way to go, but they have some limitations, resolution, computationally. 
Another way to approach this is dealing with 1D and 0D and dealing already with the, the large scales of the, the, of the corona and resolving very well in 1D where all the action happens, uh, the dynamics in your loop. And that way, and this is my last slide, what we can do is try to reproduce that observable. The corona heating problem is about reproducing very precise observables. It's about reproducing the DEM that I was talking about earlier, the distribution of the temperatures. It's about reproducing statistics on the loop evolution. What about the flux luminosity relationship? This is the, the integrated intensity of, a, of a, an active region and the unsigned flux. You have to be able to reproduce those. When you have a very strong region, uh, you have to have a lot of intensity. When you have a weak region, you have to have little intensity. And this is what I, I was, I'm doing with Lisa. Uh, what about the decay? This is the advective flux transport model, uh, predicting the evolution of the field. And we can extrapolate that and see what the, how the corona responds. So this is the avenues of work that we are doing right now to get a better grip on the problem. Sorry for not giving you <laughs> the final answer on the problem, but I hope you get understanding why this is difficult and we're still working on it. Uh, so thank you very much. I know it's a lot for after lunch. Um, I couldn't understand why there's no generalization between the density slash filling factor slash intensity. So it was clear that you could have strands of lower density creating the add up to an intensity that is similar to fewer strands with different density. I mean, well, density. yes. No, no, you got the point. If you change your density, yes. Okay. But I was assuming that you know your density from the observations. There are some assumptions in that process. You know your density from the observations, but you, take, you get your density from the intensity. Yes. But you're, you do ratios, so you, so. Okay, yeah, I'm not into corona, so. No, 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 it's, it's a fair question. There are some approximations there, because yeah. to be fair, if, if you don't, I mean, if you have a, you get your density right if your volume is filled. If it's not filled, your diagnostic is not as good. Yeah. So there are, but we do, we, we go with what we have, yeah, yeah. but those, the, I mean, so that's why that result for me is, is compelling, good, but as good as it can get in the sense that I wouldn't be extremely surprised if, if we found that that's not the case, that well, it was within our errors, but. Yeah. In our case, in this case, we, we would use uh, the ratio of two coronal lines. It was the iron 12, uh, no, iron 13. Emission measure. So the ratio of two lines, you get the, the, the density through Chianti. You use Chianti, for example, yeah. and you can get your density dependence because one of them doesn't depend on density and the other does. So, so, so you get. Well, in that particular case, David was, I mean, there are two ways of getting at this. You can feed your. Uh, you can do a emission measure analysis and get at the density trying to match to get the best the best uh, curve for your emission measure. But the simplest way to explain to somebody who is not working is that if you take the ratio of two lines, you can get directly at the density dependence. That is pure guys of thermal and they actually Yes, there are some limitations to that. Very big there are, I admit, there are limitations. But I mean, what, what is, what do you think is going to be the departure that you are going to be from? So, how far we are off the the right value? You think? Depends on the particular structure. It's usually, uh, you need some form of a filter gram observation, which can be fitted into a emission measure profile. Then, with a line ratio, you can only get the isothermal component yeah. at a fixed temperature. Yes. And if that fits, you have an isothermal density yeah. component, but that doesn't reflect the actual properties of that bulk of plasma. It, it's just seeing with uh, quartz blinders. If it's not, yeah, if it's not isothermal, yes. Uh, but in this particular case, in that paper, it was done through the DEM. So we had a lot of lines, and we did the DEM. But, it, but you're right. I mean, I'm, you're, you're making a good point. 
it's, it's, we try to do our best <laughs> with the data we have, yes. I would like to point out that uh, when you study the dependency of uh, different properties uh, with field strength, average field strength, and length, those are not entirely independent quantities, right? I mean, uh, the smaller loops that we observe would uh, tend to be somewhere close to the core, so they will not go as high as I think it's stronger than. Yeah, I think there is. That's right. But that's why why we go into the modeling part later, where you fit both properties in. So you you have a measurement of your, of your field strength, you have your length, and then you can model, in that case, what would be the response of the plasma for. But yes, we can see that there is a thing. Yes. I mean, feel free to counter. I mean, if you're not. No, you're right. I mean, no, I'm just asking if you look to the end, the end towards I've I've looked at the age evolution, and I've looked yeah. and I've noticed that the variability is greater at the early stages, and and. That I, would be the larger current sheets dissipating as a result of the mismatch, the natural mismatch. Well, that is one possible explanation. Yeah. One is that is one possible explanation, uh, but I, I cannot. So the question is how, what you're saying is concluding dominate that basically the reconnection through different topological domains is what basically drives the, the energy at the beginning. And, well, I'm but, if you can find signatures of that. Uh, I mean, people have tried to look at separators and things like that. And I think you are not, a, I mean, I don't know. I'm mean, just giving you a sense. I don't know. From the data, I cannot say, no, yes, this dominates and this doesn't. I think this is one of the issues, one of the parts that needs to be resolved. There have been some efforts in that direction. The fact that this, uh, you see also loops everywhere as well, and we could go to some of the movies and see the, the flux elements. But yes, I mean, I think there's some truth in that. And going back to your first comment of the sunspots, uh, this only just says that, of course, in all this modeling, as I said, one way is doing it the right way in terms of modeling, doing it 3D from first principles and where you get all the physics. And the other way is doing ad hoc heating. So we are adding the heating with that dependence. If you don't have a heating in the sunspot because it's not excited, whatever the mechanism is, because it's the waves are damped, or 
even if you feel strong and your length is so that doesn't say that the scaling is not correct it's just saying that uh, the mechanism is not acting in that place if it was acting there it would scale with B and L that's, I guess that's what it would say I'm brief. I'm not just only to add that I was, I gave part of it at the SPD at the test meeting, and Jim raised a question that those were steady heating models. So it's not that going and comparing those tables is going to give the answer maybe to the problem. I use it as a way of putting context, but we use them, what we do is use the scaling in the heating layer. No, no, thanks, thanks for for that. With, with the foot points strengths. So I look at that. I uh, just I had so many plots that I wanted to save you some. And I didn't find uh, maybe I haven't tried the asymmetry, the ratio. I don't know if I tried that. I tried various things, but I've, I've tr yeah, I mean I, I, I agree in on the general comment, yes, I you're you're right. I mean an average is just a description that could be very simplistic of what's going on there. So yeah, but yeah, it's one number that we use in this particular case. Yeah. Um, what can you say about um, um, how the corona should look different if um, it's heated, uh, let's say, for example, compared to the model of one in which heating occurs only at the foot points, uh, whereas uh, against models in which it's you know, created I mean, Jim was uh, Jim Clinchers has been uh, addressing this thing about because of the push of chromospheric heating. He has been addressing this in papers. I was going through that l lately for for this talk, and I he was particularly looking at Doppler. I mean, um, di spectroscopic diagnostics like line of sight velocity. But I don't know if he has a discussion on the limb. That would be interesting to see if he discussed that. From my, I mean, right now. On the spot, I don't. I don't think I can answer that. Uh, but I, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at there because. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, some of the, the coronal rain ones were at, at the limb, so that's some part of the, what we see, but nobody has modeled just yet coronal rain through 3D MSD, I don't think. And as I was saying, 1D models are not producing rain unless you have foot point heating, so that would be one. I guess coronal rain would be one. I mean, that's obvious <laughs> from my talk. Right now, with the models that we have, foot point heating will produce coronal rain that you only see, uh, that you see at the limb. And you wouldn't see that with coronal heat. But with the caveat that we, dis we do see coronal rain in flares, and we know, we think we know heating in flares in the corona. Okay, I was thinking Yaki again. Thank you.